So in our everyday world, the world that we normally live in, um, it's blindingly obvious which way time is flowing for the most part, unless you uh, happen to be in New York City. Um, so, I mean, you don't have to watch this video for very long before you realize that something is very wrong. <laughs> Um, and that, that, in fact, this video is obviously being played backwards. Um, I also find it kind of impressive the way that uh, everybody ignores the crazy lady. Um, <laughs> it's New York. It's New York. Yeah, that's the obvious explanation. This, is, this must be shot in New York. So, right. So here we are up in this macroscopic world and um, with this very strong time asymmetry. Uh, you know, we remember the past, we predict the future, we live in the present. The other extreme is, um, is, is, is a system at thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, so I'm not really sure, I'm always a bit hazy what it means to be a complex system, but I'm pretty sure that this is a simple system, that if a complex system is one that's uh, more than the sum of its parts, then a macroscopic thermodynamic system is one that is the sum of its parts. Uh, so this is, you know, this is a bottle of water, and uh, what's this? This is about half a litre, so there's about, um, it's about 10 to the 25, 10 million, billion, billion water molecules in this bottle. And they're not really doing anything very much. Um, there's the, 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 the interactions are kind of short-ranged. So effectively, there's um, many independent replicas. You know, there's a billion, billion, basically independent subsystems in here, each containing a few million uh, water molecules. And if I was to zoom in and look at the molecular detail, and I would show you a movie of these water molecules, um, it's not that there's nothing happening. Lots is happening. The water molecules are banging into each other. And, <laughs> and, and so, so there's a lot happening. But, but the more things change, the more they stay the same. So I could, I could show you a movie of, of a little region of this, this, this bottle of water. Um, and you would see the water molecules banging into each other. But I could reverse the direction of that movie, and it would look exactly the same. Uh, you wouldn't be able to tell whether I had, in fact, reversed the movie or not. So that's sort of the other extreme. A, almost really the definition of a system in thermodynamic equilibrium is that there is no arrow of time. Nothing is happening, um, broadly speaking. Of course, you know, equilibrium is, a, is a, an approximation. Um, you know, this, you know, this is like a piano in a box. Uh, eventually, it will um, decay into iron and then other things. But for a very good approximation over the time scales that we tend to care about, uh, the water in here is at equilibrium. So those are kind of the two extremes. Macroscopic world, very strong arrow of time. Thermodynamic equilibrium, no arrow of time. Oh, yes. I, I, this, so this is a movie of a glass of water. Um, <laughs> And I think you'd agree that it's very hard to tell whether I'm actually playing this movie uh, forward or back. Can you, so, so you want to guess whether it's going forward or back? Yeah. <laughs> Would you be able to do oh, it? Yeah. Uh, wait, no, OK. So, um, so it turns out there's um, an intermediate regime, which is very interesting and is very relevant to, uh, to biology, for example. So we used to, thermodynamics was really developed, uh, was inspired by the science of steam engines, macroscopic machines. And our cells, our bodies, are full of these molecular scale machines. This is a little diagram of ATP synthase. I just find this thing, the design, if you will, of this thing just incredible. It's um, two molecular motors back to back. This thing is what powers you, basically. Uh, so the, at the top, there's a molecular motor that's embedded in the membrane. It runs off a proton gradient. Protons flow through the motor, and it turns this axle in the center. And that axle transmits mechanical engine energy to this other motor at the bottom. This motor basically runs in reverse, and it converts that mechanical energy uh, back into chemical energy. It turns um, ADP into ATP. And these molecular machines are uh, you know, fundamentally different from, in operation, from the uh, kind of machines we're used to thinking about in the macroscopic world. And the, the basic fundamental difference is that the energy scale these machines are operating at is very close to the thermal energy scale. So for example, ATP has a free energy on the ballpark of about 
20 times um, thermal energy. So yeah, KT is you know, our sort of natural unit when I'm thinking about statistical mechanics. It, so at, at you know, it's just natural um, energy scale of thermal fluctuations at uh, 300 Kelvin, which is roughly what we're mostly operating at, uh, that's about, um, uh, yeah, you know, pick your favorite unit of energy. It's about 25 milli electron volts or 2.5 kilojoules per mole. So these machines, because they're operating way down here at the, near the thermal limit, uh, they're not deterministic. Your car engine will turn over at a very constant rate, uh, but these machines are going to be stochastic. They're going to um, not always operate at the same rate. And in fact, once in a while, there's even going to be a little f funny fluctuation, and it'll run backwards. And it'll um, eat ATP and kick out a few um, protons. So that regime that we end up caring about is very different from the sort of uh, um, macroscopic thermodynamics in the textbooks. What we really care about is uh, small systems, where there's really only a few degrees, uh, interesting degrees of freedom. And so this is sort of the you know, diagram. We can imagine that we have, okay, we have a gas in a cylinder. So instead of, you know, that's a standard sort of thermodynamic toy model, but instead of having a macroscopic amount of gas in that cylinder, you've got a handful of atoms. And the important point is that we have, uh, you know, we sp split the universe into various parts. We have the system of interest, that's in this case, all these atoms um, floating around here. And we have some apparatus, some method of, um, of, of perturbing the system. And then we have some environment, uh, and the environment contains most of the boring degrees of freedom. Um, we, there's often problems about how we couple the environment of the system. Sometimes we have to include a certain number of boring degrees of freedom into what we think of as the system so that the boundary between the, uh, the system and the environment uh, doesn't matter very much, the details. So, so the fundamental you know, relation of, um, of thermodynamics is the Clausius inequality, the second law of thermodynamics. The total change in entropy for any sort of thermodynamic um, process is positive. So if I take that small system, I start off in equilibrium, I take that uh, piston, I push it in, this says that the, the total change in entropy was always going to increase. Now this is not quite right, uh, the way I've stated it here. Um, even going back to you know, Boltzmann or Gibbs, we knew that uh, entropy is essentially a statistical quantity and that this is not going to be an absolute statement, that uh, weird things can happen. Once in a while, the entropy can actually go down. And the correct way of sort of stating this, really, is to put uh, angle brackets around it. Um, so the correct way of stating the second law is really that on average, the entropy increases. So you imagine replicating the experiment many times. Sometimes the entropy goes up, sometimes it goes down. But if we average over many um, um, realizations of that experiment, the entropy goes up on average. Now, something very funny happened uh, not so long ago. So this is just a different way of expressing this Clausius uh, inequality. Instead of writing in terms of entropy, it's often more convenient to write it in terms of free energy. And, and the work you do on the system. And so the free energy, uh, often we think of the free energy as the reversible work. It's the amount of, um, if, you, if you did the change you're, you're contemplating very slowly, you would put a certain amount of work in, you're doing the reversible limit, that's what the free energy change. And so any time you're doing this irreversibly, uh, you're going to, on average, have to put in more work than that. So what happened was, Chris Jasinski said, wait, we, we can rewrite this essentially not as an inequality, but an equality. We basically move the work up into an exponential here. We'd still have the average, and we have a temperature in here. And so if we take this average, this Boltzmann-weighted average of the work, we get out the, basically the exponential of the free energy change as an equality. So, there we go. 
So again, we're, we're, thinking, about, we're, we're thinking about small systems where the, the fluctuations in this work that we do on the system is going to be in the order of a few kT. That's where these uh, properties are going to be observable. And so we, we take that system, that, you know, that little uh, piston, we plunge in the, in the piston, uh, we do it at a finite rate, and each time we do that experiment, we're going to do a different amount of work on the system. And so we have a distribution of works. Here's the average work. Here's the free energy change. The average work is larger than the free energy change. But if we uh, take this, this average uh, of, of this whole distribution, we actually get out the free energy change. So this, this, seems, um, this seems kind of absurd uh, in, the, in the following sense. That, uh, that this is, is kind of sort of really a generalization of the second law. And that, seems, that just seems kind of absurd that, that after 100 and, what's that? 130 years of, of hard work, uh, we sort of move the symbols around a little bit and suddenly we have this equality instead of inequality. So this is how I got into this, this subject. It's trying to understand how on earth could this be true. So here's another example of that. Uh, again, this is a, a silly toy model. Um, it's of uh, compressing a, a, a system like this of an ideal gas with only four, four atoms in it. And it just happens to be the simplest toy model we can come up with that isn't Gaussian. There's plenty of toy models people came up with, and they just give Gaussian work distributions, which is not very interesting. So here we plot. This is the work distribution for compression. We're compressing four, four, um, four atoms by a factor of 16. And it's very broad. There's big fluctuations. And this is the negative work for the opposite process, the expansion. And if we take, you know, we take the Jasinski average of either of these distributions, we get out the free energy change. But there's more um, structure in these, in these work distributions than that. They actually cross right at the free energy change. So why is that? Um, well, it turns out there's a deeper symmetry in these, in these work distributions that uh, the, you look at the work distribution for the forward process, that actually already embeds the entire work distribution for the corresponding reverse process. So er everything about, if you know the work distribution for, the um, for compression, for example, that's a forward process here, and that's related to the um, proper distribution of the uh, reverse process by this, this equation. OK, so why is that true? Well, before we get to that, let me just point out this is um, uh, experimentally verified. So originally, uh, when people were thinking about these things, we were very much um, focused on computer simulation. A big problem in computer simulation and condensed matter physics is often we're trying to extract out uh, free energy changes. And these methods, these, these relations, suddenly give us ways of, in a computer simulation, calculating free energies using uh, non-equilibrium protocols, which sort of opened up a whole new paradigm. But after a while, um, people started saying, well, wait, actually, we can not just do these kind of things in, in computer simulations, but the um, experimental methods have advanced to the point where we can actually do this experimentally. So this is, a, this, this is a particular example from a group at Berkeley. And the basic kind of idea is that they can take a little RNA hairpin um, that's folded up here, and you attach this RNA hairpin um, you attach some long DNA linkers. And those linkers then attach to some polystyrene beads. And you attach one of those beads to this piezoelectric actuator, and you trap the other bead with a laser. And you can move the bead around with the laser. And more to the point, you can actually measure the amount of force that the laser is actually um, pushing on the bead. That means you can work out how much work you've done. So the experiment is you start off with this little RNA hairpin folded, and then you start to pull it apart at a finite rate. And you can measure how much work you had to put in to do that. Um, and then you do the reverse experiment. You start with the, with the uh, RNA hairpin extended, and you let it refold, by, and, and you measure how much work that did. And they did this at various different rates. Either they pulled it apart very slowly, <coughs> sort of trying to get towards the thermodynamic limit, um, so that quasi-static thermodynamic that we're used to, or they pulled it apart very quickly, so intrinsically out of equilibrium. And this is just the um, histogram of the work 
uh, for, these uh, for this experiment. So this is the unfolding histograms. These are the refolding histograms. And you can sort of see by eye, the easiest way to see by um, eye that this is, things are basically working as expected is that no matter where, how fast or slow you pull this apart, these histograms all cross at the free energy change. Okay, so why is that true? So now we go down deeper into, into um, what's going on here. Work distributions, we can measure and observe those. But if we go down even further and really we want to think about um, trajectories. So each realization of this experiment, there's a particular initial state and there's a particular microscopic trajectory that the system um, um, follows through uh, phase space. And for the reverse process, first protocol, first experiment, there's, in principle, the system can follow exactly the reversed trajectory. And the, pro um, the probability of the reversed, time reverse trajectory to the forward trajectory is related by the exponential of the dissipation, by the exponential of the total um, change in entropy. So entropy doesn't just qualitatively determine which direction time is flowing. We think you know, the, direction of the future is the direction of time where entropy is increasing. But in these small systems, you do the experiment, and again, you think about, I'll give you a little movie. I'll give you a little movie of the experiment. I'll show you this trajectory. Can you tell whether I'm showing the, the movie of this experiment in the forward direction, or if I reverse the movie and I'm showing it in the, um, in the opposite direction? And it's going to be ambiguous because the... The, um, the, the, the magnitude of these little systems, the magnitude of this dissipation is going to be within an order or so of KT. You can't say absolutely with certainty which way the, the, uh, the movie should be running. Um, but you can say with, you know, that it's probably going to be in the direction that the entropy is increasing. So it's uh, not just that a, um, a qualitative entropy is what breaks time reversal symmetry, that's what gives us an arrow of time. Um, on this microscopic level, it's a qualitative, um, quantitative relationship between uh, the, the forward and reverse ensemble of trajectories. So why is that true? Um, it really is embedded already, it wouldn't invent actually any new physics. Um, it's really tr um, already embedded in what we already knew about equilibrium statistical mechanics. And there's sort of two um, important properties that combine to give us this relation. One is this, that at a system in equilibrium, the probability of a particular microstate, and we have, you know, we have this environment, which ha um, this thermal environment which uh, the system is equilibrated with, that's because it's always easier to mathematically treat a canonical ensemble than a microcanonical ensemble. So we know that at equilibrium, the probability of any particular microstate is just going to be, uh, well, it's going to go KT, and there's a free energy in here, which sort of normalizes the probability distribution. And uh, then it just goes by the, the energy of the microstate. Now, note there's a temperature in these relationships. Um, there's a temperature in this equilibrium um, uh, relation. There's also a temperature in, the temperature in those non-equilibrium uh, relations. Now that sounds a bit iffy. Um, temperature is really only well defined for a macroscopic equilibrium system. Um, and many people have attempted to uh, extend the idea of temperature to non-equilibrium systems, but I think it's fair to say there's no broadly agreed uh, non-equilibrium temperature. The trick is that the temperature that appears in these relationships is not the temperature of the system. It's the temperature of the environment. And the reason is that the, there's the entropy change, there's sort of an entropy change of the system itself, but there's also an entropy change in the environment. We dump a certain amount of heat in the environment, and that is what, to, uh, and the amount of entropy, given the amount of heat we put in, is determined by that temperature. So it's always the temperature of the environment, and we completely skip, um, uh, circumvent this problem of having to define a non-equilibrium temperature. The other really important um, concept is this idea of microscopic reversibility. Now, we use words differently 
in different fields and even different sub um, parts of physics. And um, I've often found myself uh, having these, used to have these really weird conversations where clearly I was totally talking past, uh, we were to people were just talk totally talking past each other. And this often turned out to be that we were using the same word to mean subtly different things, um, coming from slightly different areas of physics. So people have often used reversibility, uh, reversible dynamics in the last few days to mean a dynamics that is invertible. So I have, say, a Hamiltonian dynamics of an, of an isolated system. I start in a particular state. I let it evolve over some point in time. I come to a definite final state. And I reverse the clock. And I'll come back to exactly the same place. Now, I don't care. That turns out not to be what I care about. Invertibility is neither uh, necessary nor sufficient. What actually matters is, um, is that the probability of a particular path. And its time reverse path is the same. So that encompassed, um, you know, I can think about uh, Hamiltonian dynamics is fine. Um, that also encompasses then any kind of stochastic dynamics because I, again, I'm really often thinking about a, um, I'm really only looking at the system and this whole environment I've sort of uh, traced out and that makes the dynamics of the actual system I'm looking at stochastic. So it's, um, in invertibility is not in fact sufficient. There are these, um, um, uh, uh, Fermostatted deterministic dynamics, Nose Hoover thermostat in, in molecular dynamics. If you take one of these deterministic dynamics on the computer uh, and you start beating on it, driving it out of equilibrium, uh, you actually get a compression of phase space. So although it's in trin invertible in the sense of I had arbitrary precision, I could run the dynamics back and go back to the same place. This, this compression of phase space means that the phase space volumes at the uh, two ends of my trajectory are not the same. So it's, um, that doesn't count. That's actually a non-equilibrium system. So being in or out of equilibrium is not a property of the system. It's a property of the ensemble from which the system was, was sampled from. So I could sample from an equilibrium system, and I, you know, I give you this, this uh, or I could sample, I could beat up on the system for a little while. It's, there's a non-equilibrium probability distribution. I could give you that. So you can't say with certainty just by looking at the the microscopic realization of the system, whether it came from equilibrium or not. The system itself does not know, which means that suppose I beat up on the system for a little while, it's out of equilibrium as, a, as an ensemble as a whole, and now I just let it coast for a little while, its behavior has to be the same as if it was, in fact, sampled from an equilibrium distribution. And that actually strongly constrains the non-equilibrium dynamics. And we get all these wonderful properties about this is how non-equilibrium statistical dynamics works. It's all about breaking time reversal symmetry at the level trajectories. Um, so where is this relevant? Again, I think it becomes very relevant when we start thinking about uh, molecular scale machines, either in the biology or the kind of nanotech machines we would really like to be able to build ourselves. Um, I'm involved you know, in my day job, as you say, in um, w the lab. We're very interested in alter alternative energy particularly from the sun. So we would like to build an artificial photosynthetic system that will take sunlight and turn it into a usable hydrocarbon fuel you can stick in your gas engine. Um, and so that means when we're going to be operating this, building these nanotech devices, um, hopefully out of solid state materials rather than rather delicate organic materials, um, we, we face the same problems that biology does. And that is that we're operating down here on single photons or single molecules and we're not that far above the thermal threshold. So for example, this is, you know, this is the photosynthetic reaction center. Um, and one of the things that any molecular scale machine right, has to do is it has to continuously break time reversal symmetry. I need to do something useful. I can't just spin forward and back. I have to continuously spin in the direction of doing something that I actually want to do. Um, and, and so in this example, uh, a photon comes in we capture the photon very efficiently, but then we have to uh, use that to do a charge separation. And we've got to get the charge separated a long way quickly. Uh, we don't want it recombining. It's also useful to realize that biology is not really trying to be efficient. Uh, thermodynamic efficiency is not its first order of business. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about those E. coli experiments. Uh, the winners are not the back of bugs that are efficient with their uh, food. They're the ones that grab as much food as possible before their neighbors do. 
So the object of the exercise is not, as a first order thing, to be efficient, it's to be fast. Uh, probably, the tr maybe, maybe it's power output is the right thing to be, think about being optimized. And so we have to, we have to split this um, charge. We can't have this charges coming back together because then you'd get a high energy photon coming off and you'd lose it to the environment. Um, or worse, it will blow your, your photosynthetic reaction center to pieces. It turns out this, one of the huge design constraints on nature for this thing is that the center of this, of this reaction center falls to pieces on the order of minutes and has to be continuously repaired which is one reason that we think we have to do, go to um, uh, solid state materials. We could build this kind of thing out of organic materials, we just don't have the ability to do that continuous repair that uh, nature does. Whereas we can build inorganic um, materials that do this hopefully much more robustly. So there is a loss in energy here of about 10 kT, ballpark. And that sort of, you can think about the cost of having to lock in this, um, lock in this charge separation. This is the cost, somehow, of having to break time reversal symmetry. So there's all sorts of fun things we can do um, to try to tease out these relationships. I, I'm just briefly going to sort of discuss a couple of ways that trying to think about this. Um, there's there's a fundamentally a trade-off then between efficiency and, and breaking time reversal symmetry. You, you don't want to waste all your energy, but you have to spend some of it in order to actually get anything done. Um, so one of the nice things is that uh, I don't know how to measure entropy once we're out of equilibrium, which is very irritating. But we can measure all sorts of entropic um, measures if what we're measuring is an entropy relative between two ensembles of trajectories, between the forward ensemble and the reverse ensemble. And one of the nice things that comes out is the average dissipation is actually just the relative entropy between the forward ensemble and the reverse ensemble. And so we add up the dissipation on both directions, we basically get the hysteresis. The hysteresis is really just the, uh, this is really just the Jeffreys divergence between the forward ensemble of trajectories and the reverse ensemble. And there's all sorts of fun things we can then play with, um, um, uh, with information theory. This is another way of sort of trying to analyze that same data. So imagine the following game. I do the experiment, I show you this molecular detailed movie, um, and I ask you which way were you running the experiment for real? Were you really um, doing the expansion or the contraction? And the amount, average amount of information, that's a one bit thing, right? It's either this way or that way, one bit. So the average amount of information you obtain from a single realization of the experiment is, is encompassed by this particular uh, Jensen-Shannon divergence measure. So it's either, you know, if the thing's perfectly reversible, you get zero bits, and if it's perfectly irreversible, you get one bit. So this is just, again, it's just a different way of trying to tease out um, uh, this, this trade-off between breaking time reversal symmetry and dissipation. Now notice that I, I keep talking about these movies. Maybe you've got every single molecular detail, and none of that matters. So in statistics terms, the sufficient statistic is, is the work or you know, broadly, more broadly speaking, it's the dissipation, if you want to determine which way the time's flowing these things. And so the idea is that there is a trade-off, as I said. So it turns out you can start making, uh, uh, talking about the trade-off between this time asymmetry, how much you break time symmetry in a particular uh, realization of a process, and how much you had to dissipate in KT. There's an area you can, there's a lower bound, so you have to, if you want to strongly break time asymmetry, you have to you know, burn about 10 kT. You don't need to burn more than 10 kT. If, if your process is burning more than 10 kT per cycle, it's probably wasting energy. So you know, one way of looking at this is that sort of a 250 milli electron volts over potential, in catalysis people often talk about the over potential, um, should be enough for, for most situations. And then you can, instead of thinking about efficient versus inefficient, um, you can more think about effective. Am I effectively using this dissipation? I've got to dissipate something, but if I'm way up over here, I'm just wasting energy. I'm, not, I'm just dissipating energy into the environment, and I'm not using it to actually break the time symmetry and actually move uh, myself along. Life wants tomorrow to look different from today. Its whole point is to continuously break time symmetry and avoid thermodynamic equilibrium. So 
it, that's the sort of, you know, the, those are the sort of the key thoughts I'd like you to take away. That there is, um, that is the entropy change quantitatively is what breaks time reversal symmetry at the level of trajectories. And that on a, on a broader level then, there's this trade-off between thermodynamic efficiency and time um, symmetry breaking. And this is relevant to, you know, this is a cartoon of the sort of photosynthetic reaction, artificial reaction things that we would like to build. Thank you.